Good evening, everyone. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Community Impact with the Lancaster Conservancy. Along with my colleague, Kelly Snavely, welcome to the Food, Farming, and Water Connection as part of Lancaster Water Week 2021, which kicked off on Friday and runs through this coming Saturday, June 12th. Water Week was launched five years ago as a community awareness campaign to celebrate the over 1,400 miles of streams and rivers in Lancaster County. These incredible water resources have driven economic development and agricultural growth in our community for generations, and these streams and rivers are the source of our drinking water. Nearly half of these 1,400 miles are currently polluted or impaired, but the good news is we can solve this problem in our lifetime with focused action which is why we are so excited for this evening's panel. Please visit LancasterWaterWeek.org to register for one of over 20 events still taking place this week. While visiting LancasterWaterWeek.org, we invite you to take the Water Week Pledge, which includes three simple action steps we can all take to be a part of the solution. Water Week is successful because of many partnerships, and this evening I wanna thank our presenting sponsor for the last five years, Turkey Hill Dairy. I also wanna recognize the Campbell Foundation, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Keystone 10 Million Tree Partnership, Lancaster County Community Foundation, Black Swama, High Foundation, City of Lancaster, Brookfield Renewable, Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, Atlee Hall, Eurofins, Flyway Excavating, Fulton Bank, St. Boniface Brewing, Lancaster County Clean Water Consortium, Lancaster Newspapers, Stroud Water Research, Lancaster General Health, Land Studies, Landis Homes, Science Factory, Inframark, Natural Light Films, Octorora Native Plant Nursery, Lancaster County Conservation District, Modern Art, and Donegal Trout Unlimited. What an incredible group of sponsors. Thank you for your continued support. A portion of all Water Week sponsorship dollars goes to support the Lancaster Clean Water Fund being administered by the Lancaster Clean Water Partners and the Lancaster County Community Foundation to support on the ground implementation. There is funding available for large and small scale clean water projects, and you can learn more by searching Lancaster Clean Water Fund. I also wanna thank our incredible community partners participating in this evening's presentation, Rodale Institute, Stroud Water Research, Lancaster Farmland Trust, and Lemon Street Market. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our host for this evening, the Director of Communications and Marketing with the Rodale Institute, Diana Martin. Welcome, Diana. Thank you so much, Fritz. I'm really thrilled to be part of Lancaster Water Week and to be joined by this incredible group of panelists to talk about something we all care deeply about, the connection between farming, healthy soil, and clean water. I'm going to give a bit of background on this issue before introducing the panelists and jumping into a robust discussion on this topic, the challenges and solutions. We'll also save some time for questions from the audience, so if you have any throughout the panel, please drop them in the q and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and get started. Okay, great. Well, I was uh, really excited to see that we actually have uh, folks joining in from other states and even I think we had a, someone joining in today from Canada. So for anyone who's not familiar with uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania farming, we're really renowned around the world for agriculture. Lancaster is known for its rich soils and our small family farms. Farming is such an important part of our community. Not only do we have access to fresh food and farmers markets, agriculture has boosted tourism in our region, supported our economy, and provides beautiful open spaces. Lancaster County has more than 5,600 farm families and nearly 70% of our county is farmland. But the agriculture we need for food and fiber has also dramatically altered our environment. Farming is now the number one source of pollution to our nation's rivers, lakes, and streams. And locally, agriculture is the single largest source of nutrient and sediment pollution entering the Chesapeake Bay. According to 2015 estimates from the Bay Program, agriculture contributes 42% of the nitrogen, 55% of the phosphorus, and 60% of the sediment entering the Bay. 
This is a phenomenon known as agriculture runoff. A better way to think of it is what we do to the land, ultimately we do to the water. So when farmers use fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides to grow their crops, those chemicals and nutrients can wash off their fields during rainfall events into local creeks and streams or leach into the groundwater. Farmers are also impacting the watershed with soil erosion from excessive tilling or plowing and with animal manure. This ag runoff has significant consequences. All of these extra nutrients from farm fields that end up in the watershed can cause giant algae blooms, which deprive the marine ecosystem of both sunlight and oxygen, creating dead zones that can kill fish and other wildlife. The Chesapeake Bay can experience dead zones of up to 1.6 cubic miles, an area where fish, crabs, oysters, and other aquatic life literally suffocate. These dead, it's important to note these dead zones are caused by ag runoff, but also from other pollution like urban runoff, wastewater treatment plants, and air pollution. Ag runoff also threatens our own drinking water, which can be contaminated with pesticides and herbicides that are detrimental to our health. Pennsylvania has faced increasing pressure from the EPA and other agencies to reduce our water pollution, but we're falling significantly behind on these targets and goals. Pennsylvania's plans to reduce water pollution rest mostly on decreasing ag runoff. But there is hope. Farmers in our area and across the nation are increasingly focused on soil health. The ground beneath our feet isn't just dirt. It's alive and healthy soils are teeming with billions of living things, bacteria, fungi, earthworms, nematodes, and so much more. When farmers use regenerative and organic practices, they can build the health of the soil, which has a positive impact on clean water. Healthy soils are less likely to erode or wash away during heavy rainfall events. In fact, they actually can absorb and hold greater amounts of water. Plus, if farmers are less reliant on chemical inputs, there's less chemicals that can end up in the watershed. A few years ago, Rodale Institute started a historic new research project with our colleagues at the Stroud Water Research Center. It's called the Watershed Impact Trial and we're collecting more data on this very issue. On 40 acres in Chester County, we're studying how different farm management practices like organic versus conventional farming or tillage versus no-till impact clean water. And in just a few years, we've already found a lot of interesting results. One thing that we found is that regenerative and organic management practices create healthier soil, which has better aggregate stability. That means that the healthier soils hold together with a glue-like substance and are less likely to break apart or wash away during heavy rainfall events. This is increasingly important as we experience more and more extreme weather from climate change. And you can see that picture here with um, soils from two different side-by-side -side farm fields, the healthier soil on the left can really hold together in that water um, where the, the soil that doesn't have as much soil organic matter is breaking apart in the water. We've also found that healthier soils have better water infiltration rates. That means that healthier soil can actually absorb more water and retain it, like the field that you're seeing on the left, which is side-by-side -side during a similar rainfall event. Um, versus the field that's on the right that doesn't have as healthy soil, you see that flooding and ponding. We've, we also know that systems that are using less chemicals, um, like an organic system that can't use pesticides like atrazine, are not contributing these chemicals into our groundwater or watersheds. We've also found that conservation practices like adding riparian buffers work and can reduce some of the farm pollution from entering the watershed. Farmers are increasingly interested in building their soil health as a way to become less reliant on costly inputs to increase their yields and to become more profitable. And organizations like the ones present in this, in this conversation today are working alongside farmers to help them implement the practices that can build soil health. So I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of this uh, presentation and introduce our panelists for today. 
Let me start with uh, Lisa Blazier. Blazier, sorry, I just asked her to make sure I said it correctly. Um, Lisa is the Soil Health Co uh, Coordinator at Stroud Water Research Center. Stroud helps to advance knowledge and stewardship of freshwater systems. Lisa is an experienced conservation professional who advocates for improving soil health to achieve water quality goals. She also serves as the coordinator for the Pennsylvania Soil Health Coalition. Thanks for being with us, Lisa. I'm also joined today by Jeb Musser, who's the Director of Land Protection at Lancaster Farmland Trust. The goals of Lancaster Farmland Trust are to preserve and steward the farmland of Lancaster County. Jeb is responsible for carrying out their farmland preservation program and on-farm conservation programs. And Jeb is also a member of Lancaster Clean Water Partners Watershed Action Team. Thanks for being here. We're also joined today by Dave Dietz. Dave is the produce and dairy manager at Lemon Street Market in Lancaster City. Lemon Street Market is a full service grocery that focuses on sustainable and healthy living with many local organic and fair trade options. Dave also grew his own chemical free produce and tended a market stand at York Central Market for 15 years. Uh, Dave serves as the board president of the Horn Farm Center in Helen, PA. And I'm also joined by, uh, thanks for being here, Dave. I'm joined by my colleague, Emily Newman. So I'm, I'm so excited to have join us in the conversation, who is our organic crop consulting program manager here at Rodale Institute. Emily works with farmers all over the country, including farmers here in Lancaster County, and helps them tra transition to certified organic. Emily is also a certified crop advisor and is currently pursuing an MBA in food and agriculture business, food and agribusiness. So thanks so much to all the, the panelists for joining. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to just jump into this conversation and start kind of helping people understand more about the connections between soil health and farming and clean water. And just a reminder for anyone who's tuning in, uh, if you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop in them in the Q&A and we'll also get to some audience questions. So Lisa, I'd like to, I'd love to start with you, put you on the spot with the first question here. Um, you're an expert on soil health. I gave a little bit of background, but I'd love if you can talk a bit more about how building soil health can protect our watersheds and what practices farmers can use to build healthy soil. Yeah, I'd love to. You did a great job making my job easier with that wonderful introduction to these concepts. So um, if you don't mind, I think I'd like to start with the second half of your question about those principles and, and practices that farmers can follow. So when we're talking about um, building soil health and regenerative agriculture, we're really talking about following principles that the natural world um, has evolved with over the years. You know, so we're, we're talking about four key principles. So for those of you listening, as I'm going through them, try to envision um, a, a mature forest or a, a prairie system out in the Midwest when we're talking about this. So. First and foremost, we wanna to try to minimize the soil disturbance. Um, you know, because when you're out, if you envision those woods or the prairie systems, oftentimes there's very, very little exposed soil. Um, there's always something covering that soil. So from an agricultural perspective, that translates um, into reduced tillage practices. Some farms are able to do continuous no-till um, practices where they haven't plowed or turned over their soil sometimes in 30 or 40 years on some of the, the acreage on the farms. Um, a, a second natural principle is that soil is always covered. There's a leaf litter layer, there's a layer of dead grass, there's that mulch layer protecting that soil from the um, powerful impact of the raindrop, which is um, oftentimes the first things that dislodge soil and we, we tend to get soil erosion from that impact of the raindrop. But then it also helps to keep that soil temperature cool. And Diana, you mentioned about the, the life in the soil. There's trillions in, of bacteria and fungus and that life in the soil that needs that cool, cool moist environment. So keeping the soil covered. Um, a fourth principle is you wanna always have a living root system. Um, so oftentimes farmers achieve this by planting something called a cover crop. 
So the main cash crop or, or feed crop for the, for the farm, if it's a dairy farm, is grown typically during those summer months. So after harvest in the fall, farmers have the opportunity to go in and plant um, species. Some of those will survive over the winter months and be there to grow in the spring. Um, some will winter kill, depending on the species. So cover crops are a really key component um, to that. And then the other thing is we wanna have diversity in the system. We wanna have as many different types of plants growing on the farm as, as we can, crops in that rotation, but then also the diversity includes getting the animals onto the landscape because magical things happen when we reconnect animals onto our agricultural fields. So by following those four basic principles, um, and what's unique is it works at any scale. I follow these same principles in my backyard garden, you know, in my, in my raised bed system. So it works at the scale of a backyard garden all the way up to a couple thousand acre farm. So by farmers following those principles, um, they're building better soil and we're getting that better soil structure, those aggregates um, that were mentioned earlier. So in terms of connecting that soil health to how it can improve water quality and the way water moves through our watersheds, um, we get better infiltration rates. So that leads to less um, runoff and flooding during those, those extreme storm events. But then it's also important because if that water soaks in, the water stays within that crop field where the farmers need it to grow their crops, but it also recharges our groundwater system. So those of you who are on wells and not on a public water system, um, that groundwater level is critical. And the groundwater also feeds our streams in the summertime and is responsible for the baseland flow. So um, there's a lot of connections between building soil health um, and how that water is able to move through the landscape, move through that soil profile, um, and keep that water cycle naturally functioning. Great, that was really helpful. Um, when you, you mentioned the role of animal agriculture and actually building soil health, um, do are people often surprised when they hear you say that? Uh, we get a lot of people who automatically think uh, animals are bad for the environment because of how most of um, animals are farmed across the U.S. in a controlled animal feed operation or industrial agriculture can be really destructive to the environment. But to your point, if we can get animals outside and grazing on pasture, they actually can have a lot of environmental benefits. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Is that something that people are often surprised to hear about how we can actually use animals as a tool to help the watershed and help the soil health? Um, sure, I can expand on that. And again, it, it goes back to mimicking mother nature, you know, and our prairie systems have always had animals that co-evolved with the prairie systems. Our forested woodlands have animals as part of that system as well. So it's not a strong stretch of the imagination that our agricultural soils have also evolved and need that connection with, with the, the animals. Um, putting that urine and the manure back directly onto the fields. The challenge is it all needs to be in balance, right? If, if you only have a certain number of acres um, to support those animals, um, they need to be properly managed so those pasture areas don't become overgrazed because we can see some detrimental effects when we have too many animals um, on a, a given amount of acreage per the farm. So yeah, like I said, there's a magical component to when you can reintroduce those animals to um, the fields. But again, it takes some level of management on the farmer's spot to, to make sure everything's in balance between the animals and the acreage that they have on the farm. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, Jeb, I'd love to kick it over to you. You're working on the ground with farmers in Lancaster County every day through your work at the Lancaster Farmland Trust. Can you talk a little bit about the current state of our county soils? Uh, how, how many farmers here are thinking about soil health and what are they working on as a community to improve it? Sure. Um, well, I think I would start off by saying that every farmer is thinking about soil health, whether they, want to, whether they know it or not. Um, 
you know, Lancaster County has got the, the most pristine non irrigated ag soils in, in the country. So it's a very valuable resource that we have here, especially in Lancaster County. So um, whether or not they're thinking it through the lens that we're speaking of, um, some certainly are, some, some are not quite, quite there yet. Um, um, but I would say, you know, how I would define the current state of our soils in Lancaster County would be um, imp improving, uh, not, not where they need to be by any stretch of the imagination probably, but um, certainly improving. Um, and I can, I can give a couple of examples. So, so Lancaster Farmland Trust in the, in the past three years has been involved with projects really uh, with the intent of completely saturating uh, the, the ag world in particular municipalities in Lancaster County and mostly in the Peck Creek, Creek watershed. And what I mean by that is uh, our teams visited every single farmer in, in three municipalities in the Peckway to have a face-to-face -face meeting to really get an understand of, understanding of what they're doing on their properties uh, as far as conservation is concerned and, and where they might need assistance. Um, and the good news is, you know, it's, it, it appears there's more out there that's being done than maybe what we, what we uh, know about as far as no-till and cover crops and, and things like that. And, um, for those of you who might be farmers or familiar, familiar with, with some of the regulations around uh, farming, you know, farmers who are uh, cultivating a certain acreage of land are required to have a conservation plan or what's sometimes called an ag and s plan. And, and oftentimes, if certain practices like no-till and cover crop are, are not um, included within a written plan, then the farmer might not be getting credit for it. So that's part of our work out there is to identify what, what BMPs or best management practices like no-till or cover crops are maybe out on the landscape uh, where we can really go through the process of getting those documented so the farmers can get credit for them. Um, I would just add that, you know, it's, it's um, Gordon Hoover on our staff, who's our ag outreach guru. He, he always says the phrase that farmers are problem solvers. Um, they're, they're always going to look to uh, obviously keep their most valuable resources on their farm. Um, and and, and they, they're, they're some of the most um, forward thinking uh, individuals um, that, that I've met. Um, certainly every bunch has, has, uh, has, the, has their different personalities, but uh, we, we're confident that farmers are problem solvers. We'll figure out a way to hopefully get this solved. Um, as far as the community conservation element of it, I mean, I would just, I would hark back to kind of the, un the unique populations of Lancaster County in um, the plain sect community. You know, we have, you know, I don't know the exact percent, but a lot of our farms are old order Amish or Mennonite farms. Um, and there, there's kind of a, a sense of community there that's a little bit different than maybe uh, outside of that community as far as a lot of the decisions are made at the leadership level in certain church districts. And, and um, a lot of times you have to start there for some of these, some of these sort of practices to really, to really take hold. Um, so that's something that a lot of organizations are, are embracing in Lancaster County is trying to tap into that that community conservation in the Plain Tech community you might hear the term frolic a lot if you think of like an Amish barn raising or something like that, really trying to tap into that. Um, but and oftentimes that, you know, in my opinion, that's kind of all it takes. It takes one or two uh, individuals uh, to kind of go out on a limb and then somebody sees their neighbor doing it and it's working, um, it'll catch on in my hope. Thank you, Jeb. Emily, I'd love to kick it over to you. I was throwing around a lot of terms in my presentation. I was talking about regenerative. I was talking about organic. And, uh, you know, you work with farmers who are transitioning to organic. I, and, you know, some of those, those terms are still con confusing to consumers. They're not really sure what regenerative means or natural or organic. Um, could you talk a little bit about what those terms mean and how they relate to this topic of clean water? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question and definitely a point of confusion for, for consumers and, and farmers alike sometimes. So um, when we talk about, you know, walking through the grocery store aisle, we're hit at us from all different angles of all these marketing terms, um, you know, it might say all natural or organic. Um, we are starting to actually see now regenerative in the marketplace as well. And so, 
you know, we, we have to kind of differentiate what that means to the consumer. And so the first place I'll start is that organic is the only federally regulated marketing term currently um, on the shelves of the grocery store. So when we walk into the grocery store and we see that really noticeable, you know, green and brown or black and white USDA seal that says USDA organic, that is the only marketing term that's currently being used um, that is federally regulated under uh, 7 CFR 205, the National Organic Program, which is a USDA program. Um, and within the organic uh, program, there are stipulations that all farmers and producers who are certified organic are required to follow. Um, one of those being maintaining and improving soil health that's codified within the regulations. And um, every time an organic farmer applies for certification uh, through a third party agency or becomes audited by an inspector, what the inspector is really looking for is that they're in maintaining and improving um, soil organic matter and soil health. And and so, you know, now you guys are experts in soil health because Lisa taught you all about soil health and knows exactly what practices that actually means um, on the ground. That is what organic farmers are doing um, to improve soil health. Now we hear other terms, uh, regenerative is very mainstream these days. We hear it being thrown around a lot. Um, and, and one thing that's really interesting is that regenerative has different contexts depending on what area of the country you're even in. So um, here in Lancaster County um, and, and on the East Coast, uh, no-till practices are huge at protecting um, soil health and uh, protecting our waterways. And so a lot of farmers in Lancaster County and Pennsylvania and the East Coast, um, we're talking, when we say regenerative, what they're talking about is the reduced tillage operations where they might be only tilling once a year. They might not be tilling at all. They might not be have tilled their land in 30 years. They might not even own a plow or any sort of cultivation equipment. Um, and they're also now cover cropping and diversifying their crop rotation system. So a farm who might have previously been doing back-to-back -back corn year after year, um, no cover crops, is now adding soybeans and peas and clover into their system, diversifying their income, uh, diversifying their farm offerings, uh, but also diversifying the ecosystem, which um, is now in their farm. Uh, so the difference, though, between the organic and the regenerative systems is that there are no third party verifications for just the term regenerative right now. So farmers who may be practicing um, regenerative farming, maybe implementing these diversified crop rotations, um, cover cropping, not tilling, um, they also may still be using herbicides their systems to control pests, weeds, and diseases um, where organic farmers are not allowed to be using prohibited synthetics within their system to control pest, weeds, and diseases and are required to implement cultural and physical and mechanical practices to control those practices. So that being said, regenerative and organic farmers there is differences in the definition, but what they're doing, each of them are implementing practices that are impacting soil health in a positive way and addressing runoff issues and water quality issues. Thanks so much for that definition, Emily. I'm actually just gonna give you a quick follow-up that came in from the, uh, our audience who's watching. Frank was asking uh, for a clarification about no-till. Does uh, no-till require herbicide to kill off weeds prior to sowing a new crop? And is that still allowed by the organic certification? Sure, that's a really excellent question, Frank. And um, right now there is really no commercially available herbicides um, in organic production. And, and that's actually why tillage is such an important tool in organic production, because to terminate a cover crop, Really at this point in time, technology has only advanced to using conservation till practices going really, really low in the soil. Um, but our Rodale Institute actually um, is and has been um, working on the roller crimper for many years and has successful, successfully found that the roller crimper works really well in a soybean system. 
Um, so, so in an organic no-till system, what we're actually practicing is reduced tillage or rotational tillage um, no-till systems. Um, within regenerative systems, however, they are allowed to use herbicides and are using reduced herbicides in those systems because they can use reduced herbicides in those systems um, to terminate the cover crop and go into their cash crop that following year. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, in an organic no-till system, we uh, grow up a cover crop really, really tall, and then we use this thing called a roller crimper to flatten it and actually kill the cover crop, and we use it. It basically creates a mulch that we plant right into, and that cover crop mulch uh, helps suppress weeds. So we have some really cool information about that on our website at Rodale Institute. The roller crimper we developed, it looks like a giant Twizzler. So that's uh, always a really fun part about it. It has this chevron pattern and ours are always bright red. So um, you, yeah, you can check that out if you're interested in what organic no-till looks like. Um, thank you so much, Emily. And Dave, I, I'd love to kick it over to you. Emily started off by talking about kind of you're, you're walking down a grocery store aisle and you're inundated now with so many different uh, marketing for around food terms and you're trying to figure out what's best for my family, you know, what's best for my values I align with, uh, like the environment. Can you talk a little bit about when you're sourcing local products for Lemon Street Market? Um, what do you think about, what, do you, what are you considering when you're trying to figure out what farmers to support and what are your shoppers asking about when they come in and, and they're interested in buying these sustainable and organic and local goods? Okay, thanks, Diana. Um, I think that some of the things that we really care about at Lemon Street Market are uh, health and the environment and justice. Uh, those are three big concepts that leap out at me immediately when I think of Lemon Street Market and our customers as well, um, value those things very much. Um, so consequently, we, we really do focus a lot as much as we can on purchasing from small scale sustainable producers uh, locally uh, as much as possible. Um, we, uh, if you come to our store, you'll see a lot of little blue circular tags around the store. Some of them are blue and they say local. Um, they're just on the shelves all over the place. And some of them are green and they say regional. Uh, and so we define local for our purposes as within 50 miles of the store and regional as within a, a day's drive. So depending on how fast you drive, I, I don't know how far you can stretch that. <laughs> but it's kind of like New York uh, down to, you know, uh, North Carolina or something like that or Virginia. I don't But anyway, um, it's it's really important to us to to really support um, farmers that are, are in it because they love the land. And, you know, um, we, um, also, um, we do a lot of, um, of buying of, of products that are like grass-fed uh, meats that are, you know, are, or dairy products uh, that are on a pasture-based system, um, you know, chickens that are actually on pasture outside, um, not just cage-free, you know, some of the terms that Emily discussed earlier, you know, how so many terms are not regulated other than organic and, and uh, you know, people buy cage-free eggs and they think they're getting something really natural, but it's probably from a, a big CAFO operation inside of a barn. So um, anyway, we, um, we just try as much as we can to, to support farmers that are really loving their small piece of, of land locally. And, you know, you think about a sense of place and we all love where we live and the farmers that we deal with love where they live. And um, so, you know, that is also um, helping to preserve green space because if we're keeping small independent farms viable are uh, doing our part to help with that, they're also, you know, not going huge with huge buildings or whatever and increasing runoff and so on. And, and um, we also, you know, some of the farmers that we buy from are certified organic, some are using organic practices, but um, because they're so small, they choose not to get certified. And we call that chem-free. Uh, that's a term that we use, but you know, we're, we're really glad that they're not putting pesticides and herbicides onto the land that are running off into the streams. And uh, yeah, that's about it. That's great. Thanks, Steve. And 
Um, I love Lemon Street Market. So, so happy to have you in the community and just really important to offer those options. And, you know, as people get more and more removed from agriculture, to be to be able to go in a store where you can learn a little bit more about the food and have more transparency about where it came from and the practices they use is, is really incredible. Um, actually, uh, if I can I'll take give you a follow up that just came in from our audience um, was just asking if you could tell a little bit more about how you might audit the, fa the farmers that you choose to host at Lemon Street Market. Um, do you ever do a site visit? Do you ask them more about their practices? Are you just looking for those labels, like a certification that they might carry? Just be really helpful to understand a little bit more about how you actually kind of vet or find those farmers that align with your values. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, some of the farms we've been to, um, a lot of them we get from Lancaster um, Farm Fresh, which is a local certified organic uh, co-op or Franklin Sustainable Farms, which is also a certified organic co-op. Um, we, we, we visit some of the farms that we pick up from, some of the Amish uh, farms. And um, so, but we don't have a specific audit that we yearly um, visit every farm. So that's a good suggestion and I'll take that um, into consideration. And I have been thinking I'd like to get out to every farm and actually try to do a little bit of work on each farm, but the, the last year has been kind of hectic for sure, and um, that wasn't possible. But hopefully, as things stabilize in our society a little, uh, we can get time to do something like that. Thank you. People are volunteering to go with you and and mm -hmm. put some work in on the farm. So maybe we'll organize some Lemon Street Market farm work days. Um, thank you so much for that, Dave. Sure. Lisa, I'd love to kick it back to you. Um, you know, every single one of us on the on this panel works closely with farmers. We know that farmers are stewards of the land. They care about the land that they're on. And um, so when we're talking about this issue of ag runoff, it's not because, the, you know, our farmers aren't these environmental stewards who care about the land and, and are, um, want to do the best by it as possible. So can you talk a little bit about what are some of the real challenges that farmers are facing that's kind of, um, you know, pushing them to rely on some of these tools and um, making it so challenging to kind of think about soil health and think about their bottom lines? Um, sure, and, and you made a great point that, you know, farmers do have a strong sense of stewardship for their land and it, it's very common to hear them say that they want to leave the land in better shape for the next generation that, that takes over the farm. Um, and at least in, in Lancaster County and the, the Chesapeake Bay part of Pennsylvania and farmers in general have a very strong understanding of the importance of water quality as well. Um, and they know that they've got a big responsibility um, to help meet those sediment and, and nutrient reduction goals. Um, I'd say one of a, a common challenge that farmers still have, and especially when we're talking about the row crop farmers, is as you're building soil health, um, either you're building that biology in the soil that's able to mineralize the organic matter and, and the soil itself, um, and you're building this organic pool of good stable nutrients. So one of the challenges that farmers have as they're building soil health is how do they account for those nutrients that are in that soil organic matter that they're building or nutrients that may be absorbed and then um, released by the cover crops during the growing season as, as they're... So farmers that are still using some fertilizer need to keep that in balance. Um, so how do they account for that organic pool of, of nutrients that is much harder to measure and there's um, oftentimes not as many recommendations and balancing that with the proper amount of additional fertilizer they may need. And, and farmers, there's information out there from Penn State University and other land grant universities around the country about fertilizer recommendations. But the reality is a lot of that research is over 40 years old and was conducted on tilled ground um, that probably did not have cover crops in the system. So um, one of the things that's happening in Pennsylvania um, Penn State University is um, in the midst of a current research program that is accounting for those organic nutrients with the soil organic matter and the nutrients released by the cover crops. 
and they're in the process of updating their corn fertilizer recommendations based on um, these other components of, of the soils and sources of nutrients. So we're definitely making progress with Pennsylvania and being able to fine tune that fertilizer application because we don't want that over fertilization, especially of nitrogen because nitrogen is so vulnerable to um, dissolving in the water, um, running off in storm events, but also leaching down into our groundwater system. And then I'll touch on maybe a, a second challenge um, that farmers have, especially those farmers that um, are certified organic or who are actively just choosing not to use herbicides in their management program. So as uh, Emily mentioned, the easiest way to control those weeds is through that, that tillage event. So small scale tillage can be managed very effectively. The, the vegetable farms, um, that small scale tillage, because you can leave uh, grass, permanent grass strips in between and, and, and really um, control the way that the water flows across those farms. The challenge that we have with um, this increased demand that consumers have for organic chicken and organic pork and organic eggs is we need organic grain to supply those, those um, industries. You know, and like Dave said, a lot of those are still large scale um, industries and large scale houses and, and, and swine facilities. So the challenge that we have is how do we safely manage the ground in organic grain production? So I'm talking about corn production, soybean production and wheat production. And a lot of those crops go into feeding um, these animal systems. And Pennsylvania, we've got a lot of hilly sloped farm fields that are definitely gonna be more vulnerable to erosion um, if we've got large amounts of acreage that are exposed to, to tillage every year. Um, so those types of grain organic farms um, still um, have some challenges to make sure that they're protecting that very, very precious layer of topsoil um, and we're not losing that topsoil to, to the systems. So ground that is definitely more level, um, that has lower risk of runoff and lower slopes um, would definitely be more suitable. So we need to be very selective in Pennsylvania of um, the ground that we're choosing to, to put into organic grain production. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Jeb, I'm gonna kick it over to you next. Uh, you're with, I know that you mentioned to me recently that a lot of the farmland that Lancaster Farmland Trust is now protecting and preserving, you're requiring conservation plans. Can you talk a little bit about what a conservation plan might look like on a farm and maybe a farmer that you're working with um, to implement some of these conservation projects? Yeah, so, so uh, for those of you who might be familiar with Lancaster Farmland Trust, we, we started in the late 80s really as an entity uh, that primarily focused on farmland preservation, uh, mainly with the plain fact community. And that still is our, our bread and butter, although in the past 10 or 15 years, we've gotten more involved with this type of work related to conservation work on farms and, you know, doing some education and outreach work to farmers, but also helping uh, fund um, some of these best management practices on farms. Um, and I'd say until the last, you know, three to five years, we really kind of treated those as separate uh, elements of our mission and really kind of focused on farmland preservation. and. Uh, on one side of things. And then, and then if we had grant funding for a farmer to help out with some conservation work, we would do it all over here on this side. And if they happen to line up, that was great. Um, but in the past, uh, like I said, three to five years, we've really kind of made some efforts to marry those two together, recognizing that um, they really are, are, they really should be tied together. So uh, historically, we did not require somebody to have a conservation plan to apply to our program to preserve their farm. Certainly, we encouraged it and made the resources available if they if they were interested in getting one. But it wasn't a uh, you know a pass or fail type of uh, they could not preserve if they didn't have one. That has changed. We do require uh, all all farmers who are preserving their farm with with the trust uh, now they do have to have a, a conservation plan. And and the term conservation plan gets uh, is kind of an umbrella term at times. So. Um, in Pennsylvania, you know, the, the minimum plan that a farmer who is cultivating, I believe it's greater than 5,000 square feet uh, of cropland, 
uh, has to have what's called an ag erosion and sedimentation plan. So that, that oftentimes folks use that term and conservation plan interchangeably. Um, that's the baseline plan that a farmer needs in Pennsylvania. A full-blown capital C conservation plan, at least how we, we refer to it, is really one that's administered through, through NRCS and is a lot of times required through uh, to, to participate in a lot of federal funding programs like um, EQIP or CREP, not to throw around a bunch of acronyms, but basically all in all, like what a conservation plan or an Ag e s plan does is uh, prescribes management practices for all of the agricultural resources on the property. So uh, it would identify all of the fields that are being cultivated as, as well as pasture areas, even areas around the farmstead and some of the wooded areas and, and either document the practices that are currently occurring or recommend um, certain practices that should be taking place in those particular areas of the farm. And then also sets an implementation schedule of when the farmers to, uh, to achieve those sorts of practices. And those plans are, oft, are written through the mindset um, oftentimes of what's the, what's the, uh, the, the minimal acceptable or the, the, the maximum acceptable amount of, of soil loss that's basically permitted from, from the farm or, um, in order to, to be um, minimizing, minimizing their runoff. So, uh, and a lot of times those plans are a good starting point for a farmer who might not have nothing in place, uh, getting a plan written can at least prescribe what, what really should be done. And then we could use that plan to help apply for funding programs or make recommendations to the farmer. Um, oftentimes, a lot of these practices that we're talking about can be relatively uh, costly. Um, especially when you start talking about some concrete improvements. Now, we focus mostly on soil health, uh, obviously, as part of this discussion, but and that certainly is some of the trust work, but we also get involved with um, some, some more upland best manager practices as well, like uh, helping farmers make improvements to their barnyard areas, for example. Um, we always kind of uh, refer to the term leaky barnyard uh, and that, that really is kind of, it is kind of a, a, an issue in Lancaster County. There's, there's a lot of these old, uh, old barns and old barnyards that are have hit, hit, were historically built very close to the stream, um, and you have runoff kind of uncontrolled from those heavy use areas around the barn. So um, that and, and and really the over application of manure. Um, Lancaster is a very, uh, like I mentioned, a very productive uh, ag landscape. A, a sixty acre farm in Lancaster County is as productive as a hundreds of acre farm in, in other parts of the country. And, Therefore, you have lots of livestock in, in, close, in uh, close spaces here. So helping farmers with manure management um, and anything that requires concrete, like a manure pit or a barnyard uh, improvement area, those are, those are extremely costly improvements. Um, um, and, and helping line farmers up with grant funding is, is oftentimes uh, important for that. Um, a project that, that we really like to focus on is we, we had some grant funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation over the past three years to really marry the two aspects of our mission, preservation and conservation. We have a waiting list of about 50 farms who are waiting to preserve right now. And those farmers who are willing to implement conservation practices at the same time they were willing to preserve. Um, were basically skyrocketed to the top of our top of our list. So it's some of those unique um, partnerships, but also unique funding structures that I think are really important to achieving some of these goals. And, and you know, certainly having some incentive programs like we will preserve your farm faster if you're willing to to put in these conservation practices or these soil health practices. Things like things like that can go a long way. Thanks, Jeb. Yeah, talking about challenges for farmers, one of them is the expense, right, of implementing some of this infrastructure. Um, you know, we used to see a lot of, we used to see a lot of cows in the creeks in Lancaster, and the farmers have done a great job kind of getting their animals fenced out of the creeks, but the next step is preventing some of this manure from that's still going from the barns uh, into the into the watershed. So really great that you guys are working on that with farmers and helping them access some of that funding. Uh, Emily, I'd love to, to kick it over to you. Something we haven't really spent any time talking about yet is policy. And policy has a huge impact on farming and agriculture. Um, I mentioned that the state of Pennsylvania is facing a lot of pressure to reduce 
It's ag runoff and water pollution, especially that's going into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, one thing that's been was really exciting is actually Pennsylvania passed its own farm bill. We are the only state in the entire country to have its own farm bill. And um, one of the things that the state included in that was support for organic agriculture, actually to help some farmers who want to make these uh, transition to some of these soil health practices to help reduce our runoff. And um, that bill uh, actually is supporting some of your work, Emily. I don't know if you could just talk a little bit more about the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, um, the state's farm bill, why they're supporting organic and kind of what this, our state's trying to do to, to meet our goals around reducing our ag runoff. Yeah, so Pennsylvania is the only state to have a farm bill. So that is a really historical conquest for Pennsylvania um, to have launched uh, their own state farm bill in 2018. And, and what that actually means on the ground is $24 million going directly to farmers um, and people working in the agriculture industry. So out of that farm bill, there was a number of aspects that, um, you know, went number of funding pools that went to support farmers. And, and one of those was uh, supporting um, farmers for the transition to organic so that Pennsylvania can be a lead producer in organic products. And right now, uh, Pennsylvania is actually uh, either two or three, I can't remember if we're in two, two or three as the top producer of organic products in the United States. So we're being beat by California and potentially New York as well at this point in time. Um, so so what, what the Pennsylvania Farm Bill is doing is they were looking at, you know, where were the barriers? Um, where were the challenges that farmers were experiencing as they made their transition to organic? And they look to provide that support directly to the farmers. So what it actually allowed um, was for a nonprofit like Rodale Institute to hire staff um, to support farmers for free. So right now, um, I am an organic crop consultant. I help farmers transition to organic. Um, we have a director of the program in Pennsylvania as well who's doing that, but we're doing that for free. So we are going and visiting farmers and helping them implement their practices and providing agronomic advice to farmers in Pennsylvania who want to implement these soil health practices and make that transition to certified organic. Uh, so another really interesting part of the uh, Pennsylvania Farm Bill was the Farm Vitality Grant. And so um, right now there is $1 million available to farmers in Pennsylvania to apply for the Farm Vitality Grant. And what the Farm Vitality Grant allows for farmers to do is to um, write a business plan with the help of a business consulting firm um, that is going to get them to where they want to be as a farm business over the next couple of years. And so what a lot of farmers are using it for are to, you know, how do I implement some of these conservation practices and how do I make that benefit my bottom line? So farmers are really looking at very um, strategic ways to protect their waterways. Uh, some of those ways can be, you know, building an agroforestry buffer. So we've talked about putting buffers around the streams, but now how do we make that buffer make money for the farmer? We add in native fruits and um, orchard trees and all these food producing crops. And what that allows the farmer to do is to take some land out of, you know, traditional agricultural production, put it into trees, um, that is protecting the waterways, but also is giving them a return on their investment. So how does that actually look implemented onto a farm? And so um, the Farm Vitality Grant is, is helping farmers put that business plan together to actually see that impact um, on their bottom line in the future. And, and there's, I guess, you know, there are so many challenges that exist and, and these conservation practices do cost a lot of money. Um, but the bright side is, is that, you know, the federal government and the state government um, and local nonprofits and uh, private partnerships, you know, they're really helping make those practices a reality. And there's, there's so many different examples of that, especially, especially in Lancaster County, um, one being the Turkey Hill Partnership um, with the Chesapeake Bay and helping implement conservation practices on um, all the farmers who are producing milk for Turkey Hill. Uh, there also now was a 
NIFWIF grant, um, which is a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant that's helping farm dairy farmers in Pennsylvania transition to regenerative organic and implement those practices. And all of that wouldn't be possible without the support from the state government, from the federal government, from private partnerships, uh, from local community organizations, and, and most importantly, the farmers who are willing to implement those practices to make it a reality. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, thanks for speaking a little bit about some of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's efforts. Um, they've really been stepping up in a lot of big ways to think about soil health and how we can support farmers in our area. So I appreciate you talking about some of those. Um, Dave, I'd love, I was asking you earlier about Lemon Street Market, and I'd love to give you a chance to put your, your farmer Dave hat on. Um, you were farming chemical-free produce for 15 years. I would love to just hear more about kind of what this conversation is inspiring for you as a farmer. How did you think about your impact on the environment? And what do you wish that people knew, the consumers that come into Lemon Street Market, what do you wish that they knew about kind of the realities of, of farming? Well, uh, first of all, uh, as a farmer, I just really love the land and um, still do. And uh, I think uh, most farmers feel that way. Um, and I think also there's a um, just a, a real concern about the, the uncertainty of change um, that a lot of farmers feel because um, most people really want to do the right thing for their land and for the water. And, um, but sometimes in a lot of cases, a lot of farmers are cash poor and they're not quite sure if they can take a risk um, to transition to something new that's maybe unproven. <laughs> and um, so that's just something to bear in mind. And, you know, before we go moralizing and um, preaching to farmers that might not have everything done the right way yet, um, Think of how you would want to be persuaded if you needed to change something about you. Um, and just, um, it's a, a great idea to establish relationships with farmers and, um, you know, support them. And then if there's something that you have a question about or something that you think maybe would be done better another way, you know, approach it in the most non-threatening, you know, suggestive way. Like, have you thought about this, you know? and and just plant seeds. <laughs> um, and, and that's like, that's any way that I've ever changed for the better in my farming. It's come from that kind of influence from people. Um, another thing too is uh, there are organizations that are, they're doing uh, a lot now to try to demonstrate good ways to uh, transition to more sustainable ways of, of farming and actually, you know, make a profit doing it. And Emily just, you know, referred to, um, having edible riparian buffers. And that's something that the Horn Farm Center and, and Helm Township in York County is actually working on right now. Um, we have a, um, a uh, goal to plant 10,000 trees there this year. And so thankfully we've had grant funding to help you know, make this possible, which a lot of private farmers don't have that. Um, but we're hoping to um, get all these trees planted in a riparian um, woodland buffer area on the farm. We're sacrificing 10, sacrificing 10 acres of productive farmland. Um, but it's, that's, you know, a lot of that is going to be edible um, crops such as chestnut, elderberry, pawpaw, and so on. And, um, and you know, willows that can be used in basket making. Uh, now, the proof will be in like figuring out markets for all that down the road and so on, but we're, um, you know, really excited about the possibilities there. Uh, and uh, to answer Mark's question in the comments, uh, how you could get involved with volunteer opportunities. Well, there's one opportunity right there. If you go to hornfarmcenter.org, uh, we're doing, you know, volunteer days to get these trees in the ground. So if, if you would like to help with that, anybody is, is more than welcome to come out and help with that. So I think, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's all about a love of the land and um, you know, just relationships. And I think that's one thing that Lemon Street Market is so happy to have great relationships with both the farmers that we deal with and the, the customers. Um, and we're all really related. Thanks so much, Dave. 
Yeah, I, I think that was a really good point that it's not it's not easy for farmers to make a big change on their farm. It, it can feel like a big risk. And, you know, there's another issue we haven't even mentioned yet is the average age of the farmer in the U.S. is really uh, it's starting to get up there. We have about six times as many farmers over the age of 65 as under 35. So the average age of the farmer is, you know, over 60 years old now. So thinking about making big changes on your farm and finding a whole new different way to farm and different equipment and different markets can really be a challenge for, for our farmers. So I'm glad that you brought those up. Um, that was a great question we got from the audience. Um, Mac asked us about those volunteer opportunities and Dave just shared one. Does anyone else wanna shout out some other volunteer opportunities with your organizations? Lisa. Well. Uh, Stroud Water Research Center is also all about riparian buffers. Um, so, you know, we're getting a little late into the summer now and, and that buffer planting window, but certainly Stroud always has volunteer opportunities for getting your hands dirty and um, planting some trees along some streams. Yep. Rodale does as well. You can check our website for lots of opportunities. We just recently hosted an Earth Day volunteer day, um, and we're excited to have people back out on the farm uh, this summer and also just some great workshops and um, educational events at our farm as well. That's great. Thank you. Um, and speaking of riparian buffers, uh, one of our audience members uh, asked a follow up question about riparian buffers. I know a number of your organizations are working closely with riparian buffers. Um, I don't know, Lisa, if you want to take this or, or Jeb, um, they were wondering how long, how many years a riparian buffer will last and what are the signs that a riparian buffer is breaking down or needs repair? So how do you kind of think about planning and maintaining a project like that? I'd be happy to take first crack at that. Um, uh, That'd be great. I, yeah, my, my background is certainly more ag. We have uh, many, many other staff at Stroud that are much more knowledgeable about the buffers. But I, I think one thing to keep in mind with a buffer is it's going to evolve. You know, um, you're going to have certain species that probably um, get a jump start and, and dominate in those sunnier type conditions. But then that buffer is going to mature and then different species are going to um, evolve and, and become the dominant species in there. You mentioned the invasive species or, or trying to control the maintenance for those species that you don't want in that buffer. And that's a huge challenge, especially in those early years. Um, if, if folks don't have a good buffer maintenance plan for the first three or four years after that buffer has been planted, um, that, that maintenance in those early years is really critical. Um, and then I would say one thing too to keep an eye out for, and you know, there's there's many purposes from the buffers. Um, they shade the stream, they provide um, that leaf litter and that food source for the macroinvertebrates and the bugs and the fish in the stream. Um, but sometimes those buffers are designed to treat that that nutrient runoff, that non-point source runoff prior to reaching a stream, and we want those buffers area and that flow coming across the landscape through the buffers to be even and dispersed going through the buffers. So if you see a, a place where you're getting some concentrated flow in that buffer um, and it's not an equal dispersion of the water, um, you may want to consider um, you know, doing some level lip spreading uh, along that buffer to try to break up that concentrated flow um, and allow that water to evenly seep across that buffer and act as that filter before it gets to the stream system. That's great. Really helpful, Lisa. Anyone else want to chime in, Jeb, about riparian buffers? I know we have some interest in that from our audience. Yeah, I mean, Lisa covered the vast majority of, of my Again, we're more on the ag side, but my understanding of, of the life of a buffer too, I, I, you know, I believe it's those first three to five years that are the most critical for the survivability of the buffer. Um, and I would just say that, you know, oftentimes my conversations with farmers is um, uh, if you get a if you get a landowner who's interested in, in installing a buffer and having a buffer planted, those the, the maintenance of the buffer is oftentimes the more tricky conversation. And how's that going to happen? 
uh, I don't have the right equipment to, to pull through there and mow that, or I don't, you know, have the time to do that or, or something like that. So I know the clean water partners and Alliance or Chesapeake Bay and others in the Kent and Stroud and others in the County are, are working on, on some innovative ways uh, and buffer maintenance teams to be able to, to work on some of that, because I do think that is, that is critical. You know, it would, it would be a shame to spend all, all, all of these dollars and do all this work, putting these buffers in the ground and then have them get grown up and, and trees die and things like that. So I do think that the maintenance thing is really key. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful advice. So we're gonna do a quick wrap, round of rapid response where um, I'm gonna ask one or two questions and have all the panelists answer. And then we'll spend the rest of the time going through some Q and A that we've gotten from our uh, great attendees. So thanks everyone for being here. Um, the first question I have for everyone, there's a lot of people tuning into the conversation today who are not farmers. What's an action they can take to support farmers in building soil health and reducing ag runoff? So what's, the question is what's, what's an action everyone can do today who's listening to kind of have a positive impact on this issue? Uh, Emily, can I start with you? Sure. As a Lancaster City resident, um, my favorite Saturday afternoon activity is walking down to Lancaster Central Market and talking to the farmers and asking them about their practices and their challenges that they're facing and what we as consumers can do to help. And so I challenge everybody tuning in today to find your local farmers market, whether you're in Lancaster City or if you're in Ephrata or um, surrounding Lancaster City, just talk to a farmer and ask them what their challenges are and how you can support them as a consumer. Um, understand what's local, what's in season and, and really focus your purchasing practice on, on supporting the farmers in the area who are doing the right thing. Oh, and go to Lemon Street Market, but I won't take that away from Dave. <laughs> Thanks Dave. Well, Dave, you got a shout out. So I'm gonna kick it over to you next. Well, Emily pretty much said everything I was going to say. So well-spoken, Emily. Um, but yeah, just um, be, I, you know, also it sounds trite, but think globally, act locally. And uh, another aspect of some of our values at Lemon Street is, is justice. And, you know, we care a lot about how farmers in other countries and other parts of the world are treated. So we try to get fair trade products in when we're getting things from far away, such as bananas and avocados and so on. And um, you know, if we're aware of the practices of a big corporation that are really, you know, harmful to the environment, or um, like, you know, even though it might be certified organic, um, they might have a, a a long track record of before they had, had any organic stuff of how they treated their workers and so on. And we take that into account. And there's some things that just aren't available on our shelves sometimes because of that. And maybe our profit margins are a little more slim because of that. Um, so think about, you know, find out who what the values are of the of the farmers and the stores that you deal with, and try to support the ones that are they're kind of sticking their neck out there for a better world. Thanks, Dave. Jeb. I would say support all these great organizations you see on your screen today um, who, are, who are working with farmers on a daily basis, um, as well as all, all organizations involved in Water Week here. Um, also, you know, as, as it's kind of, the, kind, of the, kind of the elephant in the room a little bit, a little bit but, you know, talk to, your, talk to your lawmakers and legislators about when, when there are cuts being threatened to programs that help farmers put in some of these practices like uh, growing greener programs and things like that. So just be, be being aware of those sorts of things that are out there and, and you know, uh, being supportive of those uh, funding programs as well. Thanks, Job. Yeah, those are two great points that weren't raised yet. Uh, Lisa. Yeah, I'll just, um, I'll echo what the other panelists have said. Um, you know, financially support those farmers whenever you can by buying local. But I, I think also, um, if, if you see farmers that are doing a good job, let them know, you know, be that kind of emotional support too. Um, Lancaster County and Pennsylvania in general, you know, we are really leading the nation in the use of cover crops, um, of no-till practices. So 
if you're driving around Lancaster County in December and you're seeing fields of green along where you're driving, you know that those are cover crops. You know that those farmers are taking responsibility. They're doing their part. And anytime you've got the opportunity to have that conversation with the farmer and just thank them for, for making an effort and planting those cover crops and protecting the soil, I think that would go a long way. Farmers get a lot of the blame um, a lot of the time from the public, but they would also, I think, appreciate that positive feedback from the public when they're doing a good job. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate that, Lisa. Um, one last rapid round of question. Uh, in addition to Lemon Street Market, what are some other local farms or restaurants or retailers that people can support if they want to support this local water-friendly farming? Um, also feel free to throw out any other resources where people can learn more about this issue or get involved. I'll go, should I start in the same order or go to you, Emily? <laughs> Thanks, I got Keep the easy you one. On the <laughs> no, it's okay. I feel like being first is always the easiest one. Um, yeah, so I would say Lancaster Farm Fresh is a great organization. Um, they're a cooperative structure of farmers that are certified organic in Lancaster County. Um, so they are providing uh, so much produce to this county uh, through CSA structure, but also wholesale to the local restaurants. And even as far as Washington, D.C. and Baltimore and Philly, um, providing really fresh, locally produced, organically produced products. So um, just a big shout out to Lancaster Farm Fresh for supporting organic farmers in that cooperative style of structure. Um, and, and Lancaster Conservancy for the work that they're doing, protecting lands as well. Um, you know, it's not all about agriculture as well. It's also about protecting our wild areas and, and how our wild areas are protecting water health as well. So Lancaster Conservancy has an amazing trail system that gets people outside. Um, and by putting people outside, they can, can remember how to protect the outside and why it's important. So, so another big shout out to Lancaster, Lancaster Conservancy for the work that they do. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Dave? Um, John J. Jeffries, I'm not sure if you mentioned that, but um, I apologize if you already did. Uh, they're you know, a restaurant in Lancaster that really focuses on local organic and sustainable um, produced food. Uh, also, John Wright Restaurant over in Wrightsville in York County along the Susquehanna River has very similar ethics. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, also, just roadside stands, you know, you, plenty of them around. There's a lot of them. And uh, if you get to know the, you know, there are all different kinds. There's some that are just buying a lot of stuff in and reselling. You kind of figure it out if that's the case. But um, there's a lot that are just, you know, a lot of um, people just living off the land and sharing their bounty with the public. And they spring up every summer. And um, it's a great thing to, to go to them and, and to the, the various markets around um, so, yeah. What about Jeb or Lisa? Anything else you want to chime in with? Yeah, I would, um, I would uh, mention one other organization that we've recently become aware of at the trust is called Lancaster Local Provisions. Um, it's a, an organization that um, creates meal kits that you would see in, you know, in other sorts of meal kit uh, or, uh, businesses, but they really focus on locally sourced products. Um, and not only local, but they also focus on sustain on farms with sustainable practices, just like we've been talking about here tonight, sustainable and regenerative practices. So it's really kind of a neat thing. You know, they, they, they kind of create these meal kits from, uh, with products around, around the local area. And then, and then, uh, chef Diana will do kind of live zoom related, uh, cook alongs where you can get your meal kit and cook along with her. And, and it's really kind of a neat thing. Um, uh, it related to, to Dave's comment about roadside stands, the, the trust is working on kind of uh, curating a list of roadside stands on our blog, on our website. So if you're ever curious about where some are located that you may have never been to before across the county, certainly check that out too. Awesome. Anything else, Lisa, that we didn't cover? Yeah, I'll, I'll defer. I'm actually outside of the Lancaster area, so I will uh, defer to the recommendations that the rest of the panelists have made for that question. 
Well, I just got, I was writing down my own tips, so learning new stuff. I appreciate everyone sharing those. And um, I, another resource I wanted to shout out for people who are interested in this, um, Rodale Institute, we've been working with Stroud on a family-friendly campaign. I've got my, my Grow Clean Water shirt on. It's called Grow Clean Water. If you go to growcleanwater.org, um, we're talking about a lot of these topics in a very kid family and family friendly way. Um, so I just want to put that as another resource out there to learn more about this. If this is something you want to involve your whole family in talking about and maybe get your kids more involved with. So in the last couple of minutes that we have left, I'm going to take a couple questions from our audience. We've been getting lots of great questions in the Q&A and in the chat. So I'm going to um, try to take one or two of those questions right now, and then we will wrap our conversation. So um, the first question I have is, I'm going to start this with you, Jeb. Um, it's from Mike, and his question is about the, the high value of farmland in Lancaster County. Is that posing difficulty for farmers who want to keep farming? Um, are they having a hard time, you know, keeping that land in agriculture? And what does that also mean for beginning farmers? Is this a tough area for people to get into agriculture because of the expense of farmland? Uh, yes, to the second part of your question. Yeah, for for uh, for new farmers, certainly we, you know, I, that, that certainly uh, is tough, I think, in this area, uh, even greater than Lancaster County. Um, a lot of a lot of farms in Lancaster County are, are family owned and have been owned by the same family for years. And it can be it can be tough to kind of to come up with the capital to be able to get in as a new farmer. Um, and I would say that the, the growing um, uh, value of land in Lancaster County certainly does uh, pose a risk, um, I'd say, to um, to the future of agriculture in the county from a standpoint of, I think you're going to see a lot of consolidation of, of agriculture, uh, of farm operations that might be farming um, multiple farms. Uh, you might, might lose some of, some of the aspect of the small family farm um, in the future. And I think um, you know, kind of goes back to what Diana was talking about with the growing uh, average age of, of a farmer. I think it's going to be interesting to see in 20 years what, what agriculture looks like in Lancaster County with, with the aging population of, of, of the farmer. But certainly, yeah, the price of, of farmland is definitely a barrier to someone looking to get involved with, with farming. Um, and even at the quote unquote family uh, discounted price, I mean, it still is pretty astronomical. Yeah, I don't even, I haven't even seen the most recent figures of what farmland is selling for in Lancaster County, but it's probably setting records um, here compared to other, you know, other places around the country. So um, I, we have another person who wrote in who was um, wondering about if CAFOs are much of a problem uh, here in Lancaster County. Can, can anyone take that and just kind of say what a CAFO is for someone who's not familiar with that? And can anyone kind of speak to what we see with that type of animal agriculture here in our area? I, I can jump in and- Okay, I was gonna say, and then we, we can... I almost put someone on the spot. I'm gonna give it to Emily. <laughs> <laughs> so, so CAFO stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. Um, sometimes it's also just a Concentrated Animal Operation, a, a, a CAO. Um, and, and what that means is, you know, there is a legal definition for CAFO that's regulated. Um, and it's when there are a certain number of animal units and a, in a square footage of, of an operation. And where in Lancaster County, we see CAFOs most commonly is in poultry operations, um, layer and broiler production, um, dairy operations that are confinement feeding. So they're keeping them indoors um, without access to pasture. And then also in swine operations where, um, which is pig and pork production, um, where they are keeping them again indoors without any access to the outdoors. And so some of the challenges um, with CAFO operations as it relates to, you know, environmental contamination, water contamination, is um, that we are placing a large number of animals in a small area. And, and what that does is it produces a lot of manure. And, and there's figures for, you know, for per animal unit of a dairy cow, per animal unit of a, a poultry animal or poultry, um, 
like a layer or a broiler, what that actually looks like. Um, but, but basically we're just producing more manure than we have land available to spread it. And so um, where we most commonly see this issue is actually on the Eastern seaboard of, of Maryland. Um, there is a lot of poultry production, very, very close to waterways um, without all the land um, that's available to apply that manure to in a sustainable manner. Um, and so what we end up having to do is we have to store it. And Jeb has already talked a lot about the leaky barn issue um, and how that can actually contaminate waterways. Um, and if we're not storing it, we have to transport it. And transporting manure, um, you know, is very heavy, very expensive. Um, but you know, as you see CAFOs in in Lancaster County or even along the Eastern Seaboard, yeah, CAFOs are an issue in this area. Um, when you move out mid to the Midwest, um, where there's less animal production, more land, more land available to to apply that product, um, it, it's not as much as an issue. Um, but there are many Many different, you know, conservation plans um, and practices that can be put in place to store manure in a sustainable fashion so that it can be applied over, um, you know, over time instead of just, you know, all the application at once um, with a risk of a rainstorm that's going to push it directly into waterways. Yeah, thanks for taking that, Emily. And um, just looking at our time, I think we uh, we won't take any other questions from the audience. I really appreciate everyone who wrote them in and who is so engaged with our talk. Um, I'd really like to thank all of our panelists for being part of this discussion today, for the work that all of your organizations do. Um, I'd really like to kind of end on a high note. I, um, I mentioned in my opening remarks about the dead zone in the, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, what I failed to mention is last year in 2020, the dead zone was the smallest it's been since the 1980s. So this dead zone is actually decreasing. We are making improvements in the Bay. We are making improvements in our ag runoff and farmers are really leading that effort as well as organizations, um, policymakers who are investing in that effort and consumers like you. I want every single person who's joining into this talk today who, who isn't a farmer to know, you impact these decisions every single day by what you choose to put on your plate, the places you choose to go shop. You can make a difference on the, not just your own health, but the world around you. So I want this conversation to feel really empowering because when it comes to food, every single one of us plays a role and we're all connected. Um, so that being said, I just wanna thank you all so much for joining us during this panel for Lancaster Water Week. As hopefully you learned, there's a strong connection between healthy farms, healthy soil, and clean water. And even if you're not a farmer, you can make a difference by supporting local farms who are using regenerative and organic practices and other conservation practices that we talked about like riparian buffers that help protect fish, wildlife, and even our own drinking water. You can also talk to your legislators and ask them to support funding for initiatives that reduce ag runoff and protect the Chesapeake Bay. I encourage you to follow all the organizations that are part of this conversation to stay up to date on this work. And this panel was being recorded. We will send out this recording as well as some additional resources um, in the next uh, week or two once uh, the folks at the Conservancy have had a chance to get their feet back under them here from Water Week. And um, I just want to thank everyone for joining and I hope that you tune in to the, all the other great events that are coming up this week for Water Week. There's over 20 events. And for anyone who's really interested in this topic, um, Rodale Institute, we actually happen to be having our own webinar on Wednesday, just about the watershed impact trial that I mentioned. So if you want to dive deep on that research, it's a free webinar. I encourage you to, to join us. Um, or if you wanna get your kids more involved in this, I enjoy. I encourage you to check out the Grow Clean Water campaign, which is a family-friendly initiative to learn more about farming and clean water. So um, I give one last thank you to all of our panelists and all of our attendees for tuning in. And um, just remember that healthy, healthy streams, healthy food, healthy farms, uh, we need all of those for clean water. Thank you. Thanks everyone, good night.